So uh, if you have your Bibles, keep them handy, but uh, you're going to have a lot of passages of Scripture to uh, reference today, so they're going to be on the screens, or if you have the YouVersion app, you can follow on the, the, uh, the live event function that helps you to know what the notes are coming your way. But this morning, we're going to actually jump back into a series that we, I started before Easter, and then obviously some things that unfolded uh, that kind of helped us to kind of step back from this, but we're going to jump back into it today, because I, I really feel like a number of months ago when I was feeling like this was the direction God was leading us for right now, that it's a really important journey to understand this concept of getting God. And what I mean by getting God is, is that understanding who He is, no matter how long you've follow Jesus, there's always this element of us knowing him more in a way that there's certain things that we just don't get. But I think there's things that Jesus has laid out for us through the scriptures and in his life that he's exampled for us that, that allow us to actually get the things that we really need to get about who God is, which helps us to know him better. And so we, we're going to take that journey. So a number of weeks ago, we talked about getting the God who is with us. And we talked about what Jesus' birth means and that he is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And today we want to talk about getting the God who guides us and, and focusing in on this specific reality. Jesus just didn't come to be born, die, and rise from the dead. Those are the things that we always focus on, right? Those are the things we talk about what? We talk about Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter. But we miss a huge reality of what Jesus came to do. He came to live the perfect life. He came to be fully human. He came to demonstrate on earth that this is what it means to be the human being that I created you to be. Jesus is the role model for that. He's the guide. He's the leader. He's the one that we follow. And the reason this is so significant is because whether we know it or not, we struggle with really seeing clearly and following him the way we want to because we, in a sense, try to follow our own lead. We try to figure things out or not. That's the original sin. You go back to Adam and Eve. They, they opted for themselves instead of God, and we do that today. So we follow culture. We follow what we think. We follow our instincts, and we follow ourselves into all kinds of trouble. I've mentioned this before, but you can take a look at the screens. Anybody ever, ever driven in the Central Valley, in San Joaquin Valley, in Tule Fog? Anybody ever experienced that horror? It is a scary reality that when the fog kind of settles in, you can't see. You can see a picture up on the top part of the screen. You can't see very far in front of you. And the only way you get through that without sometimes having to pull over or get off the freeway so you don't get an accident like in the lower part of the screen is you have to follow the person's lights in front of you, their taillights. And as long as you can see their taillights and you follow at a safe distance, you're okay. But the moment their taillights disappear is horror. It's terror because you can't see them. You don't know where they are. And you have to keep them in view. And I remember one trip we took when we were living in Oregon. We went from Fresno back to Oregon. And no joke, six hours of Thule fog. I was like, my hands were like white knuckling the, the steering wheel and just, just like focus on those brake lights. Well, focus, well, not on the brake lights because that means that's bad. Focus on the tail lights. And if there is brake lights, then you hit your brake really hard. And I think that, that in life, sometimes you and I feel like, man, life is a, is a fog. I can't see clearly. That's why Jesus came to say, listen, just follow me. And that's why when Jesus called people, what did he say? He said, follow me, which means get in line behind him, look at his example, follow his lead, and he'll lead us where we're supposed to go. So with that understanding this morning, I'm going to ask you if you would do something with me real quick. We're just going to pray, and then we're going to jump into a number of passages that help us to understand what it looks like when God guides us. So let's prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the ultimate guide for us. So today we pray that you would remind us again, what does it look like when we follow you? How does that impact, impact our lives? But Lord, we know that what we need to do on our behalf is surrender, to give our cooperation, to allow you to open our, our eyes and, and our ears and soften our hearts to receive what you have today because we're convinced that you are at work in our lives. We ask that you would complete your work in us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, uh, John writes this really important way that we understand what it really means to follow Jesus. He says this, But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him, that this is, uh, this is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So there's the kind of the biblical foundation for where we're going today of understanding he's the model. We live the way that he lived. He's the guide. So three things of why you and I so desperately need Jesus to lead us. We so desperately need a guide in our life. The first one is this, whether we know it or not, we're lost. We are lost, absolutely lost. We struggle to find God. We, we struggle to find our way in life. 
but Jesus provides the way. That's why Jesus said this in John 14, 6. This is in the paraphrase called the message. He said, I'm the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You have uh, even seen him. So Jesus is saying, if you see me, you see God. You know God. You follow God. And this is important because the, this is Jesus' claim to exclusivity. Sometimes, uh, as followers of Jesus, people will make the claim, well, Christianity is so exclusive. And they'll say, you're exclusive. And I'll say, no, I'm not exclusive. Jesus is exclusive. He's the author of exclusivity, which means there is only one way to God. And the reason that's so significant is because if you and I are following other philosophies or other religions or other concepts, they all find, follow a similar pattern that's different than following Jesus. Because every other philosophy or world religion requires of you and I the ability to be good on our own. In fact, it requires on our behalf the ability to come from where we are to where God is. God is up on the mountain, which means if I'm a good person, then I have to find a way to scale the mountain, to get to the top of the mountain, to find God. That's the way the trajectory of religion takes us. But Christianity, following Jesus, flips it on its head. And why? Because the God of the universe doesn't hang out on the mountain. He comes down off the mountain and he lives with us. That's Jesus. That's why it's so significant. We follow Jesus, not trying to find a God who's living somewhere on the mountain that you can't find. He comes down and he reveals himself to us. And this is important because here's the reality of what's true in life, what's true in following Jesus. You and I cannot rescue ourselves. We can't find God on top of the mountain even though we try. And when we do, that's when we get into trouble. It's really interesting. When we were in Oregon, it, because of the amount, normally the amount of snow that Oregon gets, way more than California, it, and no joke, every year, Kim and I will watch the news cycle. When the snow would start to hit and we'd get some heavy snow in some of the mountains and passes in the Oregon area, guarantee every year, somebody went hiking and they got lost. Somebody turned down a road that they should have and they got lost. Somebody tried to scale Mount Hood when they shouldn't. And so then they're trying to find people, and it's this whole thing every year, and people lose their lives every single year. But we lived in Oregon for seven years, and I started to see a pattern in, in what was happening. Not every time, but the majority of times somebody got lost and they lost their lives was because of one reason. They tried to find their way back out. The people who didn't, who realized they were lost and stopped, were usually the ones that were rescued. But the ones that thought, you know what, I'm going to find my way out of this even though I'm lost, were the ones that got even more lost. And then when you're moving and you're a moving target, it really makes it difficult for rescuers to follow, find you. The same thing is true with Jesus. This is the great thing. Jesus comes down off the mountain to where you are. He doesn't say, hey, come find me. <laughs> no, he finds you. Then he says, follow me. Why? Because he knows that you and I are lost. And if we understand that, then we can surrender to this reality. I can't guide myself. I can't unlost myself. I can't find myself. Only Jesus can do that if I surrender to him and I follow his lead. Second thing, not only are we lost, but believe it or not, we're blind. We can't see how to navigate life because we live in darkness. And that's why Jesus is spoke of as light in John 4, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, in him, speaking of Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. So there's this ability that Jesus has that we don't have. We can't light our own path. Only Jesus can. And so in order for us to see clearly, to not be blind, we can't do something on our own. We have to have something outside of us, somebody outside of us, to bring clarity to our lives. Anybody ever lost power and realized how dark your house is when there are no lights? It's kind of crazy. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we lost power at the church. It was midday, power went out, and sometimes that'll happen. So we all kind of like held, like, okay, is this going to last? Is it going to just be a couple minutes and come back on? And it was for a number of hours throughout the rest of the day. But it's really interesting in our, in our building. Obviously, the, the, the classrooms and the places where are on the perimeter are near windows, and so you can navigate very easily. But the deeper you get into our building, the harder it is to see light. But I was not thinking about that, and I thought, I got to run back into my office and get something. So I go into the church office, which is, and I can still see because there's some light kind of coming from the lobby into there. And then I turn the corner towards my office, which is around another corner. It gets a little darker. And then I look into my office, and it's just this black hole. But I'm like, I remember what my office looks like. I know where my desk is. I know where the couch is. Anybody ever done that before? I don't know why I think I can navigate in the dark, because every time I know that something's there, I still find a way to run into it. I still find a way to hit my shin and get mad, right? 
because I'm convinced I can navigate darkness. You can't. Apple came up with this little cool invention on your phone. You can turn a light on and you never have to hit your shin again. And so then what happened to all of us like navigating the building with our phones, with our light on just to see where we're going. And that's what Jesus tries to, to tell us as human beings. You are in darkness, even though you think you're in light. And when you're in darkness, it requires a light outside of you to guide you where you're going. And that's why it's so important when Jesus says, follow me, I am the guide. He's, he's saying it because he knows we can't do it. We can't find our way. That's why he comes as the light, light to all people. And then there's the third reality of why we need a guide. And that's because ultimately we're confused. See, we need a guide because we don't know where to find what we would say is the good life, the life that God created you to live, the way that you were intended to be. We don't know how to get there, but we think we do. We think that we know how to live this great life that God has for us, but we're confused. In fact, you and I know we're confused because there's a number of people throughout the scriptures that demonstrate probably some similar things that we experience in our own life. Let me just record, go through a few of them. So Peter had an idea of how he had clarity, what he thought he had clarity about what the good life was. It was being really good at fishing. That was Peter's profession, that he was a good fisherman and he could make a living off that. And that was something that in, at that time was a, was a common occupation. But here's Peter, the, the expert fisherman who goes out one night and doesn't catch anything. And then some upstart carpenter walks on the seashore, encounters Peter, and says, no, Peter, try again. And Peter's like, yeah, right. And then when Peter catches more fish than he's ever seen, what does Peter do? He walks away from what he thinks is the good life. He has the biggest catch of his life, and he walks away. Why? Because he realizes Jesus has something better than he can offer himself. That was a moment of absolute clarity for Peter in his life. How about the woman at the well? What was, what was the good life for her? She thought she could find happiness through relationships with men. But she realized that that was empty and she was just being used and abused by men. And then she meets one man that's different than all of them. He doesn't want anything from her. He doesn't want to use her or abuse her. He has something to offer her that she's never had before. And it's not water that comes out of a well. It's the water that comes out of Jesus, which becomes a spring of life in her that satisfies her soul. She changed. She walks away from that well. By the way, if you read the story, she leaves behind the reason she came which is to get water, because she's now found living water. Now she can't be quiet, so she goes and tells everybody in, in her town, come meet this guy who's told me everything I've ever done. She now saw the good life. How about the, we call him the rich young ruler. He had an idea of what the good life was. It was to be rich. If I have money, I'm happy. Boy, was he confused, because Jesus gives him all the reasons. In fact, he thinks he's perfect because he checks off all the boxes for the religious law that he grew up under. And then Jesus says, yeah, but you're lacking one thing. Isn't it interesting to say to a rich man, you're lacking? That's offensive, right? Because he has everything because he has money. And Jesus says, no, you have money, but you still lack one thing. And then he says, to gain that one thing, you have to let go of your wealth. The good life doesn't look like being rich. The good life is following me, being willing up to giving up everything to follow me. I, I go through those because it's a reminder to you and I, all of us have a definition of good life. We do. And that's what sometimes drives our lives. That if I have this career, I have this income level, or I live in this house, or I have this relationship, or I drive this car, or I reach this status in life, that's the good life. That's what everybody does in humanity. And then Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 you're confused. That's not what brings good life. I'm the one that brings good life. I'm the one that lived the perfect life. I'm the ultimate guide. Because when you look at Jesus and understand the way that he lived his life, it's very different than what we would say is the good life. So that's... That's the areas where we may struggle and realize how deeply we need a guide. But in order for us to understand that, here's the thing that really is difficult sometimes. If we're going to let Jesus guide us, newsflash, that means he's in charge. You don't tell the leader where to go. Followers don't tell the leader how to lead. You do what the leader says. You, as our childhood game would tell us, you follow the leader which means the leader will usually take you where you don't want to go because he's the leader. And to follow Jesus, to really get God means, getting the God who guides you means you will go where he calls you to go. So I want to just take some time to talk about the places that Jesus will lead you that you may not want to go, but it's the very places that you will find God the most in your life. 
It's the places where you will truly get God. The first one is the one that we don't like, but is the one that is most obvious. Getting God who guides you means getting God through suffering. I wish it wasn't this way, but aren't you glad that we're not God? (laughs) Jesus will guide us into suffering because it's necessary to know God. It is. It's truly necessary. Peter, who struggled with suffering when he was following Jesus early on, didn't want anything to do with suffering, did not want pain, did not want Jesus to die, did everything he could to avoid it, then says these words when he writes later in the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, he says this, This is the kind of life you've been invited to, the kind of life Christ lived. He suffered everything that came his way so that you would know that it could be done and also know how to do it step by step. Jesus suffered. Then another guy named Paul, who wrote another part of the New Testament, says this about his own life when he was working really hard to persecute Jesus, to cause harm, and actually cause Jesus suffering. Then when he meets Jesus, he says this, I want to know Christ and the power that raised him from the dead, and I want to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Then I have hope that I myself will be raised from the dead. What happened to these guys? They met Jesus, which means they knew suffering. And in knowing suffering means that they knew Jesus. Sometimes we struggle with that. How did Jesus suffer? Let me just walk through a few things that Jesus experienced. He was mistreated by many. In fact, when Jesus comes on the scene, he makes this claim that he's here to declare that the kingdom of God is here. And nobody wanted to hear that news. Not the Jews. They wanted to hear the kingdom of Israel is back. And Jesus wasn't saying that. So he gets mistreated, and during his ministry, here's, the, here's what's crazy. Talk about not being rich, not the good life, not being in wealth. Jesus was homeless, practically, literally. Once he started on his ministry, he didn't, he didn't like have this great palace that he kind of launched from and came back to. He really didn't have a home. He was betrayed by his own people, the Jews. They gave him over to the Romans. He's betrayed by his closest friends, the disciples, including Judas, who stabs him in the back. And then he goes through physical torture, and then ultimately he's crucified. Like, I don't want to sign up for that. But why is that so important? Because there's something in suffering that draws you closer to Jesus than when it's not there. And you can see this over and over again. I think one of the greatest examples I've saw in the last number of years was actually back in 2007. There was a group of 23 missionaries um, from Korea that were in there. They're in Afghanistan. Talk about a tough mission field. And they were there trying to, to care and reach, for, reach people, and they got uh, kidnapped by the Taliban, and right off the bat, two of them were executed. So 23 goes down to 21. And now the, the rest of them, they've been separated, they're awaiting their execution, and th- basically they were able to negotiate and free those 21. But after they'd gone through this ordeal, they get back home, and a number of them started to go through something that they had never experienced before. In fact, let me read a quote from one of them. Talking to the pastor who was with them on this trip, this is what one of them they said. They said, Pastor, don't you wish we were still in prison by the Taliban? When I was surrounded by these soldiers, I felt the presence of Jesus in there with me. Now that we are back home in Seoul, I'm trying to experience that intimacy with him, but I can't. I fast and I pray and I don't feel it. I would rather be back there because of the intimacy I had with him. You're like, well, that's great for them. I don't know if I want to go be kidnapped by the Taliban. They're they're describing something that many of us never experience. They've reached the point of suffering and persecution where all they have left is Jesus, and they feel the closest to him. And that's something to be said to us about the understanding that suffering is the pathway that God uses us to draw intimacy. He does. Because when you and I suffer, he strips away all the stuff that you and I think is the good life, all the stuff that we use to to make ourselves comfortable, and he finally gets down to the core of who we are, and that is that we desperately need him. We desperately need him to lead us and to guide us. Then the second thing, we need the God who guides us, and we do that through getting God through dying. And you're like, wait a second. No, this is not one of those suicide cults. We're not going to drink any lemonade or Gatorade or Kool-Aid at the end of the service. What are we talking about? Jesus calls us to die to ourselves. So listen what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I was put to death on the cross with Jesus. Not physically. He says, I don't live anymore. It is Christ who lives in me. I still live in my body, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to save me. What is, what is he talking about? 
He's saying, I so identify with Jesus, even though I wasn't physically nailed to the cross, my life died with him. The life that I used to live died with him. And so what is left is not my life. What is left is his life through me. That's how Paul draws intimacy. And that's why Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus knew what he was talking about. The pathway to life is through death, dying to myself. And the, the, that's the other thing. Jesus said, take up my cross, your cross, daily. Why? Because we have a tendency to resurrect the flesh every day. Comes back, got to be crucified again. Got to die to myself in this situation. Have to give of myself in this situation. Theologian and pastor Russell Joyce said this, and this caught my attention. He said this. He said, it's much easier to call people to the foot of the cross than it is to join Jesus on the cross. The call was not to the foot of the cross. The call was to pick up your own cross. And I know we sing it in songs, and it's great that we, we come to the feet, of the, feet, the feet of Jesus. We come to the foot of the cross, and we lay our lives down. We lay our sin down. We lay our burdens down. You know what? When you read through the Bible, it's not there. The call is not to come to the foot of the cross. The call is to come join Jesus on the cross. Why is this significant? Well, when we're on the cross instead of at the foot of the cross, here's the reality. At the foot of the cross, you can always walk away. When you're on the cross, you can never walk away. When you're at the foot of the cross, you can witness the suffering of Jesus. If you're on the cross, you're experiencing suffering with Jesus. At the foot of the cross, you can save your life, but eventually lose it. On the cross, you'll lose your life, but you'll eventually find it. That means that Jesus wants us to carry our burdens to him, but he says, come join me. Allow your life to die with mine so that what is resurrected is new life. It's the life that I want you to live and so that's the decision every day is to come again and die again and let God resurrect in me the things he wants in my life. Then leads to the final thing. And that is getting the God who guides us through getting God through loving. So he calls us to follow through suffering, through dying, and then truly loving people. So following Jesus will lead you to the heart of God. And the heart of God demonstrates what true love is. And if we get love, we get God because God is love. So listen how Jesus defines and demonstrates love. This is probably not our definition of love, but this is his. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 44. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's a little bit different than what we're used to. Love those who hate you, love those who persecute you, love your enemies. Jesus goes on Luke chapter 23, verse 33 to 34. He says, and when they came to the place called the skull where they were crucifying him, the criminals, one on his uh, right and one on his left, Jesus said to them, or said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What is Jesus doing? The very thing he said in Matthew 5. He's loving his enemies. Just let that settle in. Jesus is hanging in severe pain on the cross, knowing he's going to die. And he looks down at the, the ones that are guilty. The Jewish leaders who have betrayed him and handed him over to the Romans, the Romans who have physically crucified him. And he looks at all of them and he says to God, he says to the Father, forgive them. When you can offer forgiveness to your enemy, you know that you love them. Because forgiveness is not something easily offered. Author Jim Wilder uh, said something very interesting. He's lived in, in many countries where there's been a high level of persecution, and he's seen Christians suffer immensely. And he had an observation that was very interesting. He said, you know, many people say that one of the missing ingredients in the United States is that we don't have enough persecution, therefore our, we don't value our faith, which is probably true. But he said, what's really going on with persecution? He goes, it's not the persecution that makes Christianity more valuable and actually more attractive around the world. He said what he sees underneath the surface is Christians around the world who are being persecuted have found a way to love their enemies. And no other world religion makes that claim or even attempts to do that. They don't love their enemies. They annihilate their enemies. But Jesus comes along and says love is what? Love is loving the person who hates you. Love is loving the person who persecutes you. This is difficult. 
And here's the challenge, and this is one of the things that's been a challenge my entire life. There are so many things that Jesus say, says that are so hard. They're difficult. People have classified them as the hard sayings of Jesus. Claims like, when somebody strikes you, strike them back, right? No. Turn the other cheek, right? If they want you to go one mile, go two those are hard. And you know what we have a tendency to do? I know I've done this. We look at those things, especially what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, and we read them and we say, well, Jesus didn't really mean that literally. No. He's defining what it means to love. And that means that you and I don't get to come along as the follower and say, uh, leader, I don't think you really mean what you, you're saying. I, I think there's some different kind of understanding. So we get really wise. We get really smart. And then we explain away what Jesus is saying. And the reason that I know it's a challenge for me is because that's, in my life, my, my default was not to love my enemies. Mine was to make them pay for what they've done to me. From a young age, justice was a big thing for me. It's not fair. Anybody ever said that or heard that said? That was my mantra growing up, and I said it to my parents a million times. Anytime things happened that I felt that we weren't treated fairly, I wasn't treated fairly, it's not fair. And I think my dad knew exactly what I was saying that. And when Jesus died on the cross, that wasn't fair either. But he loved me enough to do it. So let me revisit a story I've told many times about my dad and the many things that I've learned about from my dad is that my dad read through Matthew 5 through 7 probably more than anybody I've ever met in my life almost had those three chapters memorized, and then did something crazy, actually tried to live them out. And I remember that things that he would do that just made absolute no sense to me whatsoever, like the skateboard that I've told about a million times. We had a family skateboard. It said Amstutz on it. You could not mistake that it belonged to our household and some kid down the street, and it really was not a nice skateboard. It was beat up. It was old. It was used. I think we got it at a garage sale. Some kid stole it off of our front lawn, thinking he'd get away with it. And of course, as soon as I found out, because our neighbor watched the kid take it, he points to the house where the kid's from, and I'm like, let's go. I was five years old, ready? We're ready to brawl, all right? Let's go over the skateboard. And I tell my dad, I'm like, let's go get him. And so my dad and I march up the street, four or five houses, knock on the door, and I'm like, here we go. We're getting the skateboard back. And then my dad completely turns my world upside down. This kid's brother comes to the door, and, and my dad addresses the kid who's in the background, and he comes to the door, and this is what my dad says to me. Hey, I heard you, you wanted to buy a skateboard. And the kid's eyes got really big. He's like, oh, yeah? And my dad takes out his wallet and empties it and says, here's some money. Hopefully, it could help you get towards buying a skateboard. I'm like, oh, he's lost it. <laughs> and then we're literally, we're, we're walking back down the four houses to our house, and I was letting my dad have it. Dad, are you crazy? He has our skateboard. Our neighbor told, it, told me that he's the kid who stole it, and now he has your money too. And my dad's just calm. He's like, that's okay. That's okay. This is what God would want us to do. I'm like, I don't think God would want us to do this. Not the God I know, right? And I'm telling him until I go to bed that night, just mad, just angry, just feel like this is not just, this is not right, until the next morning, bright and early, I think it was like 7 a.m., knock on the door, and there's the kid's dad, the kid, the skateboard, and the money with an apology. And then I realized, Dad, now I know what you're doing. You were loving your enemy. You were going the extra mile. You were giving more than expected. You were turning the cheek. You were doing the very things that Jesus wanted. And that's like one of a thousand stories I could tell my dad. Now, it's not to say that every time we do that, everything turns out perfectly. But the reality is this. Jesus is the leader. And there's a reason he is and we're not because we can't be, because we won't do the hard things that Jesus calls us to. And when we don't do the hard things, you know what we don't get? We don't get God. I know Jesus better today because I watched my dad do hard things, and then I had to learn to follow. And that's where I met Jesus, and that's where I got to know him. That's where I got things that I didn't understand about God, because we actually learned to do what he called us to do, to what John said, live as Jesus lived. And that's the call for us today, is will we be willing to do what Jesus calls us to do? Will we be willing 
to follow him where he leads us, even if it's places that we don't want to go. I've been thinking about this. If we really want to get God, what if we stopped defending our rights, taking revenge, and hating our enemies? What if we genuinely loved people? What if we genuinely listened to people like Jesus did? Jesus hung out with sinners all the time. What do you think Jesus was doing when he went over to a party at someone's house and there's prostitutes and there's tax collectors? He's listening to their stories. Even though he knows they're sinful, even though he knows they're wrong, even though they're way off base, even though they, they don't deserve to be with the God of the universe, he sat there and he's listening to them, tell their stories, get to know them. Why do you think Jesus was such an expert on humanity? Because he spent time with people who were different than him. Because he loved people that would be perceived as his enemies. What if we were to do that? I think we might get God more. I think we might represent him better too. So let me, let me close with this and things to, to reflect on. Here's the question. Will you follow Jesus where he leads you in his footsteps through suffering or will you be your own guide and, guide and never ever really get God? St. Augustine said this. He said, what am I to myself but a guide to my own self-destruction? That's humanity. When we let ourselves be the guide, that's where we go. That's the world we live in. But Jesus offers us a different opportunity. So we're going to close in a minute, but I want you to just do, do me a favor. If you close your eyes, I want us to, to give time to reflect and respond to what God is saying to you. And there's some things I want to go through here because I, I believe that part of the challenge of us letting Jesus be the guide and getting God is that there are some really specific, maybe even practical things in our lives that are really kind of the battleground of what it looks like for us to let Jesus lead, us to follow him, and us ultimately to understand more about God through him. And so let me just ask some questions, and maybe there was ones that are off this script, but, but for you, maybe these this are ones that would hit you. And this is the question. Asking when you face daily things, decisions, lifestyle choices, career, family decisions, relationship decisions, everything, asking this question, is this what I want or is this what Jesus wants? Is this where I'm leading myself or is this where Jesus is leading me? Think about this. When it comes to your career, is your career your choice or is it the career that Jesus has chosen for you? Has he pointed you on a certain direction that says, this is what I want you, but you're thinking, but, but, but I won't make enough money. Jesus would say, but, but are you going to follow me? But I don't even know if I would be good at that, but, but are you going to follow me? I don't even know if I would like that, but Jesus says, are you going to follow me? Your relationships. This could come in a number of different facets. You may be sitting here today and you're contemplating divorce that decision is that what Jesus wants for you is that what you want for you you're like well you don't you don't know my spouse you don't know the pain that I, that's been afflicted you don't know what I've walked through Jesus knows all the suffering you've gone through but the question is what is he saying what does he want for you how about your finances the way that you look at your finances your resources the way you spend money the way you save money the way you Go into debt, not go into debt. Is that what Jesus would want for you? Or is that what you want for yourself? These are the decisions. How about in your sexuality? Maybe you're grappling with your own internal, maybe your own gender dysphoria where you feel a disconnect from what you know you are biologically, but you're battling because you feel like you would express yourself differently. And, and there's all this tension inside of you and the cult culture around you is telling you, yes, you go with what you feel, but there's one still small voice that's more important than anything culture will say. What does Jesus want for you? Maybe you've been tempted into a same-sex relationship and your, your, dial, your debate in that is that you feel like if you go down that road, you'll be more happy and somehow more satisfied because you feel a draw towards that, but you know that something inside of you stirred up to say, is this really right? And Jesus is saying, is this what you want or is this what I want? How about in our retirement? 
the retirement that you, the lifestyle you are living in your retirement, is, is this the life that Jesus wants for you or is this the life that you want for you? And you're like, Pastor John, please don't go down this road. I worked hard to get where I'm at. I've, I've saved money and, and I worked all those years now that I can rest. And Jesus would ask you, is this the retirement I have for you or is this the retirement you've created for yourself? I don't know if there's other categories that maybe for you today as you're reflecting right where you're at right now that you're, it's not on that list, but you know what it is. You know that you're relying on your own guidance, your own leadership, and now as you begin to think about what it means to get God, you're thinking, is this really what Jesus wants for me or have I even not even listened to what he, he said to me or haven't followed where he's guiding me to go? Here's the bottom line. Following Jesus is hard, but when we do, the outcome God has in our life goes way beyond anything we could imagine. And I'm going to close with this, again with your eyes closed. The ultimate example of this, talk about being hard to follow God. Moments before Jesus was arrested, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's pouring his heart out to the Father. He knows what's coming. He knows the suffering he's going to go through. He knows why he has to do it. He knows all of those things and, and why this is God's will and God's purpose. But he still says in his humanity, if there's any other way, if there is option B, if there is another plan, if there is another way around this, let, let's go that way. But, but Jesus resolves in himself, trusting the Father enough to say, not my will but thy will be done. In other words, not what I think I want or what I think is best, but ultimately what you think is best. And here's the outcome. Jesus submits to the Father, follows him through suffering, torture, betrayal, a trial. He suffers on the cross. He dies. But here's what happens. Jesus rises from the dead. And Paul writes this in Philippians and says of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, someday, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. How did Jesus get there? He followed the lead of the Father. Through death, through resurrection, ultimately, to be the ultimate authority over the entire universe. So whatever you're facing, Today, God is leading you through. Jesus is saying, follow me. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be where you're supposed to be. It's going to be the life you're supposed to live. It's going to lead to the outcome I've desired for you. It's going to lead to the good life that you thought you would define for yourself, but it's going to be better because it's going to be more fulfilling. Not going to be easy, but it's going to be more fulfilling. And so Jesus, today, we thank you that you truly are a trustworthy leader that shows up in the middle of the fog and confusion and blindness in our lives, and you guide us and you direct us. But Lord, we know that you will always lead us to places we would not lead ourselves. That's why you're the leader. So Lord, I ask today as we, we conclude, would you give us, I know the thing that we all need is we need courage. We need courage to say yes to you, to do what you want us to do, Lord, it's so easy to default to kind of the conventional wisdom or the things that we think that make sense or the things that are most comfortable or the things that require the least amount of risk, Lord. But we know that ultimately following you means that we don't come to the foot of the cross. We join you. And in joining you, Lord, we, you, you kill off, you let die the things that don't belong, our sin, our brokenness, our failed attempts at being our own God, and what you resurrect is the life you create us to live. So Lord, let us live into that as you guide us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? As we conclude, a couple important things. Uh, Terry and Sherry here over here to my left, uh, beneath the screen there, they're our prayer team. And if you would like them just to agree with you on whatever God's speaking to you today about what it means for him to really lead you, um, they're there. If you have a physical need you need prayer for, that God would bring healing to your life, you can go for prayer as well. But really important as we, as we, as we conclude, uh, what I just described is one of the most basic things about what it means to be a Christian. It's this decision that says, I'm going to follow Jesus. 
And that's the decision you make initially, and then that's the decision you make every day the rest of your life. For some here, maybe you've never initially made that decision, but today you know you want to. So I'm going to encourage you, if you came with someone who you know they've made that decision, tell them, hey, today I'm making the decision. I'm going to choose to follow Jesus. If you don't have that kind of person, I'm going to be up front, or Terry and Sherry will be over here. You can, you can come and tell us, say, yeah, I, I'm making that decision today. I want to choose to follow Jesus. It's the first step in this journey of what it means to really live the life that God created you to live through Jesus. Now we all get to go out and live that out in our lives this week. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.